to belong to our church and our church to belong to you. Um, so you'll learn about that in Connections class. Uh, now, moving on, my wife Nikki is hands down the hardest worker in our family. She works tirelessly um, in her work and in helping us raise our kids and in um, all the things about, yeah, just being a while. A lot of you know that, and you're like, yes, and amen. So when she gets a, a, you know, a night to go hang out with her friends, she, it's well-deserved, it's well-loved. You know what I'm talking about, all you um, working mamas out there, like it's just well, well-deserved. Um, what I do when she goes out, like it's, say it's a Tuesday night, she goes out with her friends, um, has dinner at Cielo because I guess we're rich or something. And I stay home. So I stay home. And what I do for like two hours, for, if she's gone, for about an hour and 55 minutes, I'll sit, I'll read something. Maybe I'll watch a show that I like and she doesn't like. I'll probably eat something bad for me. But here's what I'll do. As soon as I hear her car come back in the driveway, I run to the sink and I do dishes. <laughs> She walks in, got her <laughs> every time. <laughs> Obviously, I know you're like, I know that move. I do that move. Obviously, what I know and what you know is that to really, to really bless her, uh, she doesn't just want me to look busy while she's gone. She wants me to be busy. And even more, she wants to know that I've been busy, that I've been using uh, time productively and redemptively while she's been away. I say that connection is obvious. We've spent the last month trying to understand when and what it'll be like when Jesus comes back. And we know that he doesn't want to find us running to the sink, acting like we've been doing dishes the whole time. What he wants to know is that we've been busy the whole time, that we've been using time redemptively, using it productively while he's been away. We've spent the last four or five weeks deep in Matthew 24, deep in Bible nerd land, trying to speculate and understand different views, trying to wrap our heads around this teaching that is confusing and clear, and it's scary and it's hopeful all at the same time. And now in chapter 25, Jesus is rounding the corner and he's going to land the plane on this conversation by answering the practical question that I think chapter 24 is meant to raise in all of us. I think it's this question, how will Jesus find me? When he comes back, how will Jesus find me? And I love this shift in tone because it's where we get to accept everything that's out of our control, which is all of chapter 24, and we get to decide what we do with what's in our control. See, you don't get to decide anything about when or where or how Jesus comes back. You can learn and speculate and try to understand it, but you don't get to decide or control any of it. God is the single member of that planning committee and he has not invited anyone else to be a part of it. But you and I get to decide what you'll be doing when he comes back. How will Jesus find me? He helps us answer first with these two very culturally challenging parables that teach distinct but complementary ideas. And then he closes with this one illustration and imperative to wrap the whole conversation. Now, I want to invite out three friends. I asked them to volunteer earlier because there's a lot of verses we're going to go over and I want to read them all, verses one through 46. So wherever you are, yeah, come on up. And we've got one more. He might be, there he is. Come on up, grab a mic. And I'm just going to have them read straight through in the three sections. Um, so if you would listen up, give full attention uh, to this chapter of Matthew. Go for it. All right, this is in 25. It's verse one, the parable of the 10 virgins. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered saying, since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast and the door was shut. Afterwards, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, 
to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them and made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Also, and he also who had the two talents came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward, saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid. And I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have scattered no seed? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received at least what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast that worthless servant into the outer darkness, In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Thank you. Hey, let me pray for us. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Uh, the public reading of it. Even as we did that, would you help us realize that there are um, Christians all over the world who would, who would give anything to do what we just did for a couple minutes, just reading Scripture publicly, loudly, in a microphone, in a room that uh, has lights on and doors open, and we're here to, to preach your word, Lord. We're thankful for this moment. Uh, thankful for the clarity of your word, even amidst um, some of the things that make it harder to understand. I pray now, Lord, you would just uh, be pleased with the meditations of our heart and the things that we speak and think about it. Would you be honored? In Jesus' name, amen? Amen. 
Uh, well, thank you. Uh, I think sometimes it's helpful with long portions of Scripture just to hear it in different voices and uh, also just a mental trick to help us pay attention more than if I were just saying it for 46 verses straight. So J.C. Ryle has a quote that's helpful um, and really helped me frame the talk this morning. He said, The practical lesson of each parable is the main point of difference here. Vigilance is the keynote of the first parable. Diligence is that of the second. The story of the virgins calls on the church to watch, and the story of the talents calls on the church to work. Hence the name of the sermon, Watching and Working. And those will be the two things I want to encourage us to be doing when Jesus returns. So number one, when Jesus comes back, if you want to be prepared, let him find you watching. Look at the first parable. And let's talk about the word virgins just really quick, but not too long. Um, If you're like me with your 21st century modern sensibility, there's something um, off-putting about the way that we would categorize a group of people in a story here. Um, It literally just means an unmarried girl who's helping with the wedding, likely part of this bridal party, um, probably had a job or a duty to help the the wedding happen. I just want to say that to to be careful not to let um, our 21st century Western sensibilities make you react against a first century Middle Eastern text in any way. Um, Sometimes we do that when we come to the Bible and we kind of like put our, like we try to westernize um, that text with how we think of a certain word. And so let's not do that. Um, But anyways, there were 10 of the, the girls total. Five were foolish, we learn, which means they took no oil for their lamps. Um, taking extra oil for their lamps was about being prepared in case things didn't go how they expected them to. So they brought enough to last the length of how long a normal wedding should have lasted. There were five who were wise, which means that they brought extra oil. The groom was delayed. Shocker. It's a parable. Like, that's the point of the thing. They all fell asleep. The foolish girls needed more oil. The wise girls said the stores that way (laughs) and sent them on their way. While they were gone, the groom came, started the feast, and he shut the door. The foolish girls tried to get back in, but the groom said, I don't know you, which feels harsh. And I think it's supposed to feel harsh. It's not about the oil here. It's not about favoritism. It's about the difference between vigilant preparedness on one hand and foolish presumption on the other hand. It's the two postures, the two reflexes of these five and these five, vigilant preparedness and foolish presumption. You got to understand the job, the opportunity, the conditions, they were the same for all 10 girls. Their job was most likely just to provide light for the bridal procession. The difference comes down to who was prepared for the unexpected. In the event that it took longer than you thought it might take for the groom to come back, how prepared were you? In other words, were you watching? Were you waiting? It's about the readiness or the lack of readiness of each person. That's what drives the meaning of the parable. So the painful truth here is in the presumption of the five who were unprepared. It's not even that they were lazy. That's not the idea. It says that they, they ran to the store. They were trying to get what they needed to get. It's that they had this underlying assumption the whole time that if we do what's required, but just a little bit outside of the given conditions or requirements or expectations, then of course, here's the presumption, then of course the merciful groom will let us back in. Of course the patient and loving groom would grant us an exception. They were saying if and when the time comes, which we're not even sure it will because we've waited for so long, if and when the time comes, we'll just borrow some oil from those who were well prepared. Or maybe how it sounds to you, the way that you've heard it or said it, It sounds more like, okay, I'll go on sinning now so that grace may abound later, right? Does that sound familiar? I'll do my thing now knowing that if I do mostly the right stuff, but just kind of outside the given restrictions and requirements, if I do it mostly like all the way, like of course the merciful good Lord, he'll grant me an exception. The difference is clear between the wise representing true, prepared and persevering saints and the foolish, the ones who are just gonna do their thing and when the groom finally comes, it's like, it's like me running to the sink and going to act like I was doing dishes the whole time. It was never real for them. They never really expected Jesus to come back at all. Frederick Bruner says it this way, that they assume that the Jesus on Judgment Day is the Jesus of Christmas Day. Little, harmless, non-threatening. Oh no. On that day, too late is too bad. Jesus will roar like a lion, not lie down like a lamb. The door will stay closed. 
Another way to think about it is that they ran out of time because earlier they had too much of it. Earlier they had all the time in the world. I haven't seen the groom any time recently. We've got plenty of time. Now this is the hardest thing for us. This is where I think it drives home. This is the hardest thing for us as modern Western Christians in an upper middle class community with an abundance of worldly opportunity and very little persecution. It is nearly impossible for you and me to remember that we're going to die and that the end is coming. It is very, very hard for us to remember that. The only time we really do is when we see it happen, when there's loss and there's grief around us. And then all of a sudden the brevity of life and the the reality of your own mortality is like front stage for you. Other than those times though, it's very hard to remember. And I think some of this is intentional. You've heard the phrase, if, if the devil can't make you sin, he'll just make you busy. Sometimes it feels like every part of the world around us is in this grand conspiracy to keep you from thinking about your own mortality for too long. Psalm 90 says, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom, which I love the connection there between wisdom and knowing that your life is numbered, knowing that your days are short and numbered. I can't think of how to number my days though. I I look at that text. I can't think of how to be numbering my days when I'm just trying to make it to bedtime without like ripping my kids' heads off, right? (laughs) Let's be honest. I can't think about how to number my days when I'm just busy counting numbers in my bank account because life costs money and I got to make a dollar stretch and it seems like there's never enough of it. I can't number my days when I'm just like trying to do what I need to do, produce what I need to produce, make what I need to make, support what I need to support. It's hard to number your days when just the normal things of life, not like they're saying you're going to live forever, but it just like starts to creep in with this little underlying message that I got to do this, this, and this, and this, so I can kind of push back my own mortality. Like, no, the end's not going to come. I'm not going to die. You're not going to die. My kids aren't going to die. That's never going to happen. Push it back, push it back, push it back. I'll just control all these things. I can keep controlling. I think there's a connection here to what John calls the desires of our flesh and the desires of our eyes and the pride of our life that become such deceptive black holes for us because these things, just just wants and needs and provisions, they can start out just as that, but without realizing that, they can become suppressants that numb that nagging feeling that life is fragile and the end is coming. It's like NyQuil when I'm cold. I'm a NyQuil guy. I know not a lot of you are. You're like, then you got to heal twice, once from the sickness, once from the medicine. You follow different accounts than I do, whatever. So I take NyQuil and it's like that 30, that's my wife. (laughs) You wouldn't catch her dead taking NyQuil. It's that 30 minutes though, after you take NyQuil, but before you fall asleep, you get drowsy, your brain and your body are relaxing, not totally asleep, but, but definitely not awake. I think there's something feverish about our own mortality that begs us to stay awake and alert, but it's like we rather just keep pounding metaphorical NyQuil to convince ourselves that we're not dying. See, all these these things of busyness and what we think is necessity, the desires of flesh and eyes and life, just convincing ourselves, we're not gonna die, we're not gonna die, we're not gonna die, the end isn't coming, the end isn't coming, no, 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 no. John goes on to say that the world is passing away along with its desires. And I fear too often that we overattach ourselves for for security, for identity to this world that literally scripture says is dying rather than watching and waiting, knowing that our king will return. I heard this story about a Christian care center for kids with developmental disabilities. They were taught the the same thing as we are taught and believe that, that Jesus loves them. They were taught the gospel that he died for them. They were taught that he would return one day and bring them home where they would be healed and made whole. So when someone asked the director what some of the problems were around there, he replied, dirty windows. And that might sound odd, but he says, kids will regularly press their hands and their faces against the windows as they look up to the sky, hoping that today might be the day that Jesus comes back and takes them home and heals them and makes them whole. Maybe it's today. And so they have chronically dirty windows. Now, for five of these 10 girls in the passage, the groom's return had become so intangible, so indefinite that they stopped expecting it altogether. The more they waited, the less they watched. 
Church, if you want to be prepared for the second coming of Christ, let him find you watching, hands and faces against the window, waiting for him to return, knowing that he will. Number one is watching. Number two, to be prepared for his return, let him find you working. Let Jesus find you working. Look at the second parable. The master went away. A lot of this is review from last week, but if you weren't here last week, the master went away. He delegated some financial stewardship to three servants. One of them got five. One of them got two. One of them got one. The one with five returned five more, so he brought back 10. The one with two returned two more, so he brought back four. The one with one, we call them a fearful collector, not an investor. He's a fearful collector, a hoarder, you could say. The master calls that servant wicked and slothful, which again, I think is meant to sound harsh. He gives his talent to the one with 10. So now that guy has 11, the other one has four, and this one has none. And the master condemns him to hell. Anytime you read gnashing or weeping of teeth in the gospel, that's a, that's a phrase for a place called hell. Just as Jesus is the bridegroom in the first parable, here he is the master. For context, a talent could be anywhere between $300,000 and $800,000. It's a detail that you can skip over and you can still get the idea of the parable because the parable is really not about the amount. We'll talk about that in a second. But I think if you just pause on that for a minute, say it is $800,000 and one of them has 11 of it, I think it's meant to impress on us the abundant generosity of Jesus. Just to think for a moment that he lavishes his servants with such resource, and I'm not talking money, I'm talking much, much more than money, with such resource that you may as well stop counting. You just know that you have more than enough. Again, the parable goes beyond the details. It's not about more or less. And we know that because the one who, who ends up walking away with 11 and the one who ends up with four, they're regarded in the same way. They each get these three rewards too, really from the, from the master. I don't know if you parsed it out as we went. He says, good job, well done, faithful servant. So you get the, the verbal praise of the master, which, oh, man, we could spend a long time talking about the power of verbal encouragement from your authority figure. Like, okay, there's something there. And then he says, here's more responsibility. So he gives them more work. You may have heard that to, to obey Jesus, to, to be part of his kingdom, it's not a bed of rest, it's a post of duty. So the faithful ones, he gives them more responsibility. And then he says, enter into the joy of your master. You get to enter in to the presence of your master where there's fullness of joy. They're regarded the same way. The one who had 11 walking away and the one who had four. It doesn't even have to be about finances. There's, of course, financial principles to draw from this. That, that's wise to do. Ideas about being faithful with little and being entrusted with much. But in context, it's not about what was given. It's about the reflexes and the, the, the posture of the stewards, regardless of what they were stewarding. In context, the money isn't money at all for you and me. I would argue the money is the gospel. The money is the good news of your forgiveness of your sins and your eternal life and hope with Jesus. The gospel is the goods that we have, that he left you with to work with. So it's like Jesus here, he's saying to you and me, okay, I'm going away and here's what I'm leaving you with. I'm leaving you with what Peter says is more precious than silver and gold. It's what Ephesians calls the unsearchable riches of his grace. What Hebrews calls a promised eternal inheritance. This is better than 10 talents. It's even better than 11 talents. This is the free gift of eternal life. This is the forgiveness of your sins. Every spiritual blessing, Ephesians says, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, being chosen, being made holy and blameless, being adopted and redeemed and freed and filled and loved, the gift that you and I will never have to wonder, am I loved? Am I valued? Am I wanted? Am I seen? Is there a hope? Is there a future for me? Because you and I have been delivered from the domain of darkness, scripture says, and delivered into the kingdom of the beloved son. It's the gospel. The good news of the gospel it says, that's what I'm leaving you with. What are you going to do? Like that's pretty solid. You and I, we carry infinite treasure every day, everywhere we go. 
And if you're the last person in your life that the gospel touches and changes, then you've buried it. We've buried it and we've missed the point completely. If you are the last person in your life touched and changed by the gospel, we've buried it and we've missed it. So number one, Jesus says, I want to find you watching, waiting. Don't grow weary of expecting me to come. Number two, I want to find you working. Are you going to bury it or are you going to work? Those are the first two parables, only parables here in this chapter. They're distinct, but they're complementary. But then we get to the last chunk, which in some ways is the most complex chunk. Jesus ends with a final word, though, that I think is so helpful in giving us a singular practical landing point. And that's where I want to land. Here's all I want to say about 31 through 46. Is that he ends by referencing a time of future separation between true committed Christians and those who have never submitted to Jesus. The faithful ones he calls sheep. The unfaithful he calls goats. Spoiler, don't be a goat. But then the most mind-blowing thing I think he does, he gives an example of how someone would be able to tell the difference between these two groups of people. And so pretend like you don't know anything about Christianity or who Christians are, how they act. It's like Jesus holds up this picture and he's like, okay, I'll show you some behaviors and some activities who will characterize, that would characterize uh, my followers, my disciples. And here's what he says. He says, they will feed those who are hungry and thirsty. They will welcome strangers. You can always read that word biblically as foreigner or alien or immigrant or other. They will clothe people who need clothing. They will care for those who are sick. They will visit people in prison. And then he basically stops teaching. Like he, he stops giving ideas. And we'll see in the next couple chapters, I mean, he's always teaching just by, by how he lives and how he does things. And he he drops gold nuggets everywhere he goes. But right here, like this is the last really concentrated, like, like you sit there, I'll sit here. I'm going to talk to you and teach you some things. This is really the end of it for Jesus. And this is what he says. He says, feed those who are hungry, welcome strangers, clothe people who need clothing, care for those who are sick, visit people in prison. If you want to know what, what Christians look like, like if you're an alien and you're like a literal extraterrestrial alien, not like a foreigner alien, like you're, you know, like alien, and you're here to collect all the Christians and you need to know what they look like by what they're doing, it's going to look something like this. And we're going to call that sheep and we're going to call these goats and the sheep will enter into eternal life and the others will not. And then he stops teaching and he gradually makes his way to the cross after that. Here's the dilemma for a person in my position reading a text like this on a, on a morning like this is that as soon as I try to take a first century Middle Eastern text, as we said this is, and I try to copy and paste these ideas into how you apply them as a 21st century modern Western American, um, as soon as I start that conversation, we will very quickly be arguing about politics. We just will. And that's not my intention and not my interest, frankly. It's not my place this morning to, to be concerned with how you may categorize these activities on a political spectrum. I don't want to open an email debate on homeless, homelessness or immigration or anything. It is my place to bring to our attention and just remind us very clearly that right here, as Jesus summarizes and concludes the most robust detailed eschatological teaching in his public ministry. So that's his teaching about the end times. Like this is it. This is kind of his, his, his big work about the end times. As we are all begging for pragmatic instruction from him, this is what he says. Feed, welcome, clothe, care, visit. The lowest and the least people. That's Jesus' conclusion. It's missional love and service. That's it. And then he drops the mic. That's his conclusion. And so I will add nothing to it and I'll take nothing from it. I will just ask, is that your conclusion? Is that your conclusion after five weeks of kind of deep study on Jesus' interpretation of the end times? We've done about four or five weeks in, in chapter 24 
in chapter 25 now. And Jesus' conclusion is it all comes down to loving and serving people. That's it. And the question is, is that your conclusion? And if it's not, if it's something other than that, I have no judgment or shame for you. I would just say, I don't know where that's coming from. I don't know where that kind of conclusion would be coming from. Maybe you walk away from eschatology, the study of the end times. Maybe you walk away with a posture of protectionism. The end is coming. Hunker down. Protect your own. Maybe literal prepping for the end of time. I don't know. Not knocking that you do that. Just don't attach it to the teaching of Jesus. Maybe it's a posture of hedonism. Life is short. Eat, drink, be merry. We're here for a good time, not a long time. You know what I mean? Maybe pragmatism and reason in an exaggerated way have robbed you from any selfless sacrifice of any kind. Are you so determined to help without hurting that you've just stopped helping? Jesus' words here, I don't don't know what it could be. Jesus' words are so strikingly simple and without qualification, without telling you how he wants you to vote, without telling you how to spend the cash from your wallet at that moment, without telling you what to think about incarceration, he says, here's some stuff I really care about for some people I really care about. Make sure it's taken care of while I'm gone. I think what helps is to remember that everything Jesus did was motivated by love. Never asking, well, how can I avoid looking like a fool? Or how can I prove that I'm right? How can I convince someone? But the question for him motivating every day, every step, I believe, is what does love require of me today? And if our reflexes to this passage somehow make us less loving rather than more loving, we've gone terribly wrong somewhere. St. Augustine summarizes with the famous line, if it seems to you that you have understood the divine scriptures or any part of them in such a way that by this understanding, you do not build up this twin love of God and neighbor, then you have not yet understood them. Church, the end of good theology is always love. That's the work he's left us to do. It's been a few years for me since I've sat with this discourse as deeply as we have. And I don't know about you, but I've just been reminded that Jesus will come back. Like I've been reminded in a, in a convicting way. That's a reality. He will come back. I don't want to be sleepy to that because when he does, he's going to find me doing something. He's going to find you doing something. The question is, church, what will it be? How will he find you? If you've become drowsy to your own mortality or if you've buried the treasure of the gospel that he left you to work with, my prayer is that this would be a wake-up call this morning as it has been for me. When our King Jesus returns, may he find us watching and working. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you again for the gift and the privilege of standing on a stage, sitting in a room, hearing your word read publicly, hearing it taught and explained. Lord, singing songs that make much of the name of Jesus. We're just so honored for what we get to do here. We pray that it would bless your heart. We pray that every piece of it would rise as a fragrant offering before you. And you would just be so pleased with your children today. And Lord, thank you for the clarity and the power of these reminders that there's so much we don't understand and so much that we can't control. But Lord, we want to be found expecting you and working while you're gone. Lord, would you find us watching and working? Because time is short. It's not promised. Heaven and hell are real. And you are real. And you're so loving and gracious and good. And even as we pray through this, Lord, I'm reminded if if there's anyone in the room who, as we talk about this, it all sounds a little crazy. It all sounds like um, kind of on the outside looking in because they haven't begun a relationship with, with Jesus. Lord, I pray right now they would consider doing that. They would know that, Jesus, you love us so much. You didn't want to see us separate from you. You came and you died on the cross for our sins. You rose again so that we could have new life and eternal life with you. Lord, if they believe that that happened and they choose to follow you, they'll be saved. They'll say goodbye to the domain of darkness and they'll say hello to the kingdom of the beloved son, the kingdom of light, kingdom of eternal life with you. So if there's anyone in the room today 
who needs to come to you, confess their sin, believe that you're able to forgive and choose to follow you, I pray they would do that right now. And they would begin the rest of their life today. Jesus, we just confess you are the king. You're worthy of all praise. Uh, Lord, you have been slain like a lamb and there will be a day when you come back as a victorious lion. We're thankful for that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.